Hello, Happy Sabbath. How are you all? I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful week. And tonight, I continue to ask the Lord to protect each one of you, and protect your families also, and that His peace, joy, and love will fill you. If you remember, two weeks ago, we talked about Joseph, how his brothers hated him with a jealous hatred. They plotted to kill him, but when they saw some merchants passing by, they decided to sell him. So he was sold to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, in Egypt. This week we'll continue the story, but before that. I would like to share with you something very interesting about the reason behind Jacob's special love for Joseph. If you remember in the beginning of the story, the brother hated Joseph, you know, because the father loved Joseph more than the others, and gave him a colorful coat, a very special coat. So there's an interesting observation of why Jacob. Love Jacob so much more than his the other sons, and this observation is written by a rabbi. This rabbi's name is called Rabbi Zalman Marosov. I'm sorry, Rabbi Zalman Marosov. He said, "The Jewish literature Talmud pointed out whatever happened to the father Jacob also happened to the son Joseph." Their lives were a mirror image of each other. Jacob's mother didn't give birth for many years, so too Joseph's mother Rachel. Jacob's mother had a difficult childbirth, so too the son Joseph's mother. Jacob's mother had two sons, and son Joseph's mother Rachel also had two sons. Jacob was a shepherd, so too his son Joseph. Jacob received the birthright of the birth firstborn from his brother. His son Joseph also was given his brother's firstborn birthright. Jacob was hated by his brother. His son Joseph was also hated by his brothers. Jacob, <clears throat> excuse me. Was sent away from his father's house, so too his son Joseph was sent away to Egypt. Laban, for whom Jacob worked, was blessed with great wealth due to Jacob's merit. His son Joseph's master Potiphar was also blessed with great wealth because Joseph's merit. Jacob married outside the Promised Land. His son Joseph too, unlike his brothers, married his wife in Egypt. While Jacob's blessings were received through a dream, his son Joseph was appointed ruler of Egypt also on account of a dream. Jacob made his children promise they would take him out of Egypt and bury him in Israel. His son Joseph also made his brothers. Promised that he would be buried in Israel. Jacob took care of his son Joseph for seventeen years. Joseph was seventeen years old when he was sold to slavery. And then his son Joseph took care of Jacob, the father, for his last seventeen years. While Jacob came to Egypt at the age of hundred and thirty. And passed away at hundred and forty-seven. Isn't this interesting? I often wonder: Did God plan it this way? Maybe you can come up with an answer. When you do, please share with me. Now let's go to Genesis chapter thirty-nine, verse one. Now Joseph had been bought, brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, 
who have brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. After talking about Judah's story, the text resumes the story of Joseph. We are taking up where chapter 37 left off. We read here that although Joseph was sold as a slave to Egypt, but the Lord was with him and he became successful. Verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Well, Joseph became the best employee in Potiphar's house. Potiphar placed all that he owned under Joseph's authority. Because of God's blessing to Joseph, Potiphar prospered. And this reminds us that those who are chosen by God are means of blessing to those who are yet to know who God is. Remember that if the Israelite was chosen because God said you are going to be a nation of priests. Priests meaning what? They are in the middle between God and others. They are to bring others to God. So this is what we see here about Joseph. You know, because of him, Potiphar prospered. Let's read verse 7. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as he spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. Well, this passage said, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. He probably took his good look from his mother. In the previous chapter, Genesis 29, 17, said Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. This was probably another reason why Joseph loved, I mean, Jacob loved Joseph. When he looked at Joseph, he felt comforted of the death of his beloved wife. Here also in this passage, Joseph's action was contrary to his brothers, Reuben and Judah. If you remember, Reuben slept with his father's wife and Judah slept with his daughter-in-law who dressed as a prostitute. Although Joseph was being seduced by Potiphar's wife relentlessly, day after day, he did not give in. He would not even be with her. He would not and cannot. So what was his reason? He said not only it was a sin against his master, but it was a sin against God. Adultery was considered great sin in the ancient Near East. Remember earlier in Genesis chapter 20 verse 9, Abimelech scolded Abraham of almost bringing great sin to him and his nation when he did not tell them that Sarah was his wife. For Joseph, 
he was particularly conscious of what he does because he was living in the presence of God. Let's read on verse 11. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, that means Potiphar's wife, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lift up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came to me and laughed at me. But as soon as I lift up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Well, this is the second time in this short story of Joseph's life that someone uses one of Joseph's garment or cloaks to deceive others. Potiphar's wife exploits the situation to the maximum. She emphasizes that Joseph foreign status by describing him as a Hebrew. And she presents Joseph assault on her as an assault on the entire household, persuading her servants to support her while the passion and forcefulness of Potiphar's wife in condemning Joseph is a chilling reminder of how vengeful human nature can be. Let's read on verse 19. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So after Potiphar heard what the wife had told, he was burned with anger. But whom was Potiphar furious with, Joseph or his wife? The passage didn't say. After all, Joseph was not killed, but simply imprisoned where the king's prisoners were confined. You know, in the ancient Near East, I mentioned earlier that adultery was a serious crime, a serious offense. Serious offense that would result with swift action like execution. And jails were not common in the ancient world since imprisonment was not a standard punishment for crimes. If Potiphar truly believed that Joseph, his slave, was guilty of sexually assaulting his wife, execution would have been the swift and normal response, right? But instead, Joseph was confined where political prisoners were kept to await trial, judgment, or execution. Furthermore, since Potiphar was referred to 
as the captain of the guard, which means he was responsible for the safekeeping of state prisoners and also for the execution of sentence upon them. In the cases of treason, he himself was sometimes executed the sentence himself. So he was the chief of the king's bodyguard. Later on in the story, Joseph met Potiphar's other officials in the house of the captain of the guard. That means that these other officials that were under Potiphar. So it appears that Joseph was detained under Potiphar's supervision and was there again given authority. In another word, Joseph was transferred to another department that belongs to Potiphar's area of control. Well, that doesn't mean that his imprisonment was a pretense, but it just suggests that Potiphar's anger may well have been directed to his wife instead of Joseph. In order to save face, he gave an adequate show of indignation. When things cooled down, Joseph gradually moved into position of authority again. While this story actually was straightforward, Joseph was sold to Potiphar's house and he was very successful because God blessed him. And then because of his good look, Potiphar's wife seduced him. But Joseph would not be with her. He said, how can I do this wicked thing against God and also against my earthly master? And so the result was anger from Potiphar, but who knows it was anger towards him or towards his wife. The result was he was in prison and this prison was also one of Potiphar's responsibility, his area of control. So the story will continue next week. So in summary, what have we, what have we learned from this passage? Well, Joseph understood that any sin we commit is really an offense against God. And that all the work that we do is done as for the Lord, according to Paul. He said in Colossians 3.23. Of course, any opportunity we have to serve God will bring times of testing along with it. These trials keep us dependent upon the Lord and loyal to him. Joseph was faithful and it cost him greatly. Yet God did not forget Joseph's obedience. And at the proper time, he blessed him abundantly. And in this story, there's another interesting observation. Do you know that Joseph's story and Christ's story are parallel. Christ was loved by God the Father. Christ was sent by his Father to spiritually feed his brothers, but they did not accept him. They sold him to the Roman soldiers for 30 pieces of silver. He suffered enormously. And through his suffering, he saved his people and who will live one day in peace in the kingdom of the heavenly father. And how about Joseph? He was loved by his father, Jacob. He was sent by his father to feed his brothers, but they did not accept him. They sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. He suffered a lot in exile and in prison. And through his suffering, he saved his people from death. And then they live in peace in the beautiful land of Goshen in Egypt. So, and furthermore, 
nowhere in the entire 13th chapter narrative of Joseph do we find any hint of sin in Joseph's behavior. So, does it mean that the Bible is preparing Joseph to serve as a type of Christ? Think about it. Happy Sabbath.